thanks for indulging me, because we don't normally do two combined rounds in a row, but uh, I was bumped by Mary Rosco Darvish last week. <laughs> anyway, the reason why I wanted to do a joint round, because this is really trying to go outside of our own departmental way of thinking. We all know that pancreas cancer is a tough problem. And just to keep on thinking that the box is going to produce a smart drug that's going to fix a problem, it's time that we move on. And we move on by exploiting resources. And what I want to lead you through is the incredible richness in our own local community. We've always thought traditionally, we look outside of Toronto, somehow go to Johns Hopkins or Harvard or Novartis, but there's actually a ton of stuff going on within our own academic community, which most traditions I think are not fully aware of. So what I'm going to try and do is to alert you to that. Um, there's a wealth of stuff, and I'm going to go fairly quickly, fairly superficially over a lot of ground, so I hope I don't exhaust you. Um, so the educational objectives are really trying to understand why is pancreatic cancer so hard to treat. Uh, again, the, the, the second bullet in my objectives is looking beyond our own department. So what did we mean by the low-hanging fruit? So Ming Chao was responsible for getting me involved in pancreas almost 20 years ago. And Ming said, well, David, they're really interesting. They're, they're tough cancers to treat, but it's all due to the KRAS mutation. So if only you can come up with some smart way of targeting RAS, the problem will get better. Maybe I missed it. Slide is missing. Picture me. So the, I had a beautiful diagram from a grant that was actually funded, which is totally <laughs> primitive understanding of the RAS signaling through PI3 kinase. So that was missing from there. But anyway, so we started working on this as with the idea that abnormal survival signaling is coming through RAS to PI3 kinase. And we were pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we were the first group to establish primary xenografts from patients. It's actually done by Sylvia Ring, who was a very energetic um, grad student with me. She's now actually PGY2 in radiation uh, medicine. So we established xenografts. We were also one of the first groups to use phospho-specific antibodies to actually track the effects of signal transduction inhibitors. And we were also the first to use the Star, the animal imaging facilities in the STAR program to start imaging mice to try and monitor in a way that would simulate how we would monitor response in a patient. This is actually Nisha Danny's efforts here. So we seem to have it all together in the lab, science, the drugs, the analytical methods. And what happens, and this happens here, this is Malcolm Moore's famous um, clinical trial adding an EGF receptor inhibitor to standard chemotherapy and getting a highly significant extension of survival by 10 days. I don't have a laser pointer with me to demonstrate. You can actually put a laser pointer between the curves, but I believe that you can. And this is kind of, was almost got into the New England Journal of Medicine because it was the first study to show statistically significant improvement, adding a targeted agent to treating pancreatic cancer. And the horror is that after all these years, we don't have a single targeted agent first line treating pancreatic cancer. So this kind of was good, but didn't work. So where are we right now? Like, well, of course, the big thing now is to go into whole genome sequencing. This is a paper that came out two weeks ago in Nature from an enormous group. There's hundreds of authors on this paper. And it's based on sequencing about 450 pancreatic cancer. This is a hodgepodge of tissue from pancreatectomies from all over the world, which is why there are so many authors. I doubt that any of them have actually read the paper. But it's trying to identify, to discover mutations in pancreatic cancer that might be actionable <coughs> beyond the ones that we already know, like RAS. And it gets into nature because of this curve here. They actually assign into four different categories and one squamous carcinoma, shock horror, does worse than the rest of them, which is not big, so we've known this for years. But otherwise, the signatures don't really track outcome, okay, which is a bit concerning, because if you really were identifying a whole genomic differences in pancreatic cancer, you would think they would separate out survival. And the other problem is that it doesn't actually find new actionable drug targets as far as I can <coughs> see. So it may just be a bit of hand-waving, I'm not sure. So for now, we're kind of stuck with chemo, which is humiliating, but these are, there is progress made. These are our own surgical cases published last year. Uh, 
these are survival following uh, pancreatectomy uh, and over two decades of periods, which are separated by the introduction of adjuvant chemotherapy. And we do actually improve outcome. It surprises me almost that adjuvant chemotherapy using gemcitabine would work in pancreatic cancer, but it does. So there is some improvement in outcome. When you're dealing with a disease as fatal as pancreatic cancer, even some improvement is good. To me, this is the other big humiliation, personally. This is Folfirinox. This came out with a huge fanfare of trumpets in the New England Journal four years ago. It basically sucks. It's three chemo drugs just randomly mixed together, like we used to do when I was a clinical fellow at the Royal Mars <laughs> 40 years ago, almost. They just mix the drugs together. It's as toxic as hell. And But wow, look at what it does. It extends survival by three months. This is New England Journal material. Uh, you ignore the fact that in two years there aren't any long-term survivors. So this is now the big thing in pancreatic cancer. I shouldn't knock it too much incidentally because Fulfrinox does actually benefit patients. We, we treat them, they're, they've got pain, they're getting worse, you treat them. And it's quite common in the clinic to get major responses to this treatment. But it's a bit of a band-aid solution and intellectually it doesn't take us anywhere. We're pushing chemo as far as we can go so we get a bit of improvement in survival. So it's kind of rest in peace, the science of medical oncology. A bit of a humiliation for somebody who's always believed that science is going to fix pancreatic cancer. So where are we? So considering that by 2030, if things go, we're going to be the second leading cause of cancer death, we should be depressed. But the amazing thing with the pancreas cancer group here is that we're actually all upbeat. Um, so there's loads of good stuff going on in our backyard, and this is basically the focus of this talk. But the other important point is it centers around a multidisciplinary clinic, the McCain Clinic, which was established by Steve Gallinger and uh, Malcolm Moore for a large donation from the McCain family. And we're now seeing more than 400 cases a year, which is about a third of the Ontario total, but they're all gathered into one multidisciplinary, really well-functioning uh, clinic. And there are some people in this room who make this clinic really work well. And it's a joy to work because we sort the patients out quickly in a timely manner. We actually probably save the healthcare system money because the patients are not lingering around having unnecessary scans and tests done in smaller centers. So I'm going to skip through some um, of our work now. And I'm going to start with the COMPASS trial. This is actually just launched uh, at the end of last year. This was Malcolm Moore's original brainchild but it's been taken over by Jennifer Knox. And COMPASS isn't really a trial, it's a cohort study. What it's doing is it's studying metastatic disease, because most of pancreatic cancer is metastatic. Yet all the genomic studies are based around pancreatectomies, which is a subpopulation. And so this is kind of Toronto sequencing effort strikes back because we keep getting pit by other groups publishing in Nature. There's a huge amount of sequencing, sequencing work done here, spearheaded by Steve Gallinger. And it's a cohort study of newly diagnosed patients, and we actually do true cut biopsies from liver metastasis. When they, we originally discovered, discussed this with Malcolm, we thought maybe 30% of patients would consent to have a biopsy done for research purposes, and it's actually close to 100%. Then the patients go on to first-line chemotherapy, but the cool thing is that the sequencing turns around in a two-month time frame, which is when we assess the response to first-line chemotherapy. So the intent is eventually we would have information from that uh, to make informed treatment decisions. And this is kind of optimistically expecting that the landscape will change. And although we have a dearth of targeted agents, that will change. And I don't have the time to talk about it, but there are some interesting new actionable targets starting to appear in the pancreatic cancer genomes. So I'm not going to say more about this. This is not really my study. It's progressing well. And Jennifer or a, a, cure, a clinical fellow can update at a later point there. What I'm going to move on to now, though, is a companion study going on with this cohort, which I'm more involved with, along with Nisha Dani, looking at hypoxia using Farzapet MRI imaging. So I'll update you now on the hypoxia story in pancreatic cancer. Now, several years ago, using primary xenografts grown in the pancreas of mice, we made a striking observation that 
if you measure the extent of hypoxia in these xenografts, which is on this axis here, and cell proliferation using thymidine analog bromodeoxyuridine uptake, the so high values mean fast proliferating, high values mean hypoxic. There's a very obvious positive correlation. If you look at which ones spontaneously metastasize in the mouse model, they're shaded black, then the hypoxic fast-growing ones metastasize, and these error bars are quite tight, meaning that individual patients' tumors are consistent between individual mice. However, if you look at the, how bromodeoxyuridine and hypoxia actually register histologically with dual fluorescence imaging, so red is hypoxic and green are the nuclei of dividing cells. They're obviously mutually exclusive, so how does hypoxia cause things to grow faster? Well, it obviously doesn't. So how do we explain those data? And this is one attempted uh, linking together I, I've come up with. First of all, there's a transmittable component because each one breeds true. There's rapid growth, which we can explain <coughs> with the classic mutations in pancreatic cancer, P53 loss, uh, RAS overexpression, loss of P16, which would make things grow faster. And certainly fast growth can cause things to become hypoxic. It just pushes them away from blood vessels. Uh, and fast growth can cause disease progression and death. So it may be this, is, this upper arm is all that's going on, and the hypoxia is just a chance phenomenon that occurs of no great consequence. But there's a lot of work that's come out of, particularly out of our own group here over 20 years, that hypoxia tolerance needs to occur in order for cells to become hypoxic, otherwise hypoxia just kills them. And that hypoxia tolerance itself is associated with metabolic changes, which is Brad Water's major interest, that allow cells to survive and then result in a reprogramming towards a treatment-resistant metastatic potential. So this is the this lower arm, then is where hypoxia fits in. So what really matters in the clinic? I'm a big believer, having worked with model systems for many years, that getting back to the patient in our business is a good idea. So this is the pimenidazole trial. This is Nisha Dani's brainchild or baby. So in order to establish, does hypoxia predict outcome in patients? We take a cohort of patients undergoing pancreatectomy and we give them the hypoxia tracer pimenidazole preoperatively. And this is, this is a huge effort getting this organized. And again, I have to thank Steve Gallinger and the surgical team for being so open to uh, collaborating with us, and Anna Dodd, who gets the patients on to study. So most patients getting a Whipple now <laughs> across the street swallow pimenidazole the day before their surgery. <coughs> we can then measure this using immunohistochemistry. So we have an accrual target of 100 patients, and that is powered to detect a relative risk of about 1.4, 1.5 of recurrence with respect to hypoxia. So it's quite a sensitive trial. Uh, it's, all, it's close to finishing accrual. <coughs> and then the big question comes, if it does show, as we found in the xenographs, that hypoxia is a disaster in these patients, and these are going to do badly anyway, what are we going to do about it? So the, you know, we better start thinking about that now and not wait for the outcome of the trial. So there's a lot of science going on in the background here with biobanking. They're all going through sequencing. Uh, we make xenographs from them to ask, do the xenographs recapitulate the patient? And I might say that they pretty closely do recapitulate the patient. And then we try to understand mechanisms, what, what's the basis for this, and how intelligently we, we might treat that with the intent that we can then come to an intervention if the trial is positive. In other words, if, if hypoxia does predict very early recurrence, what do we do about it? There's actually a lot of stuff going on here. Nisha Dani should really give the final talk on this because she's the champion who's pushed it along. And I might, I might mention in parentheses that there are now four or five similar studies opening up in Toronto. This is, this is a huge amount of work goes on here, just standardizing everything and dealing with all of the logistical and the problems of sampling error that goes into this. I won't talk about that. So what if the pimenidazole trial is positive? Well, if it tracks the metastasis like we see in the xenographs, there's probably not a lot you can do about that because the patients have come to your clinic, the metastases are already there, you can't go back and stop them from happening. But one of the interesting things that we see in the spontaneous metastases 
in the xenografts. And we actually have some anecdotal patient material where we've taken small little early metastases from patients who've had primonidazole, is that you see hypoxia early in the growth of metastases. This is a 100 micron scale bar there. This is in a mouse. So the red is hypoxic, and then the blue is just a necrotic center. Then green is proliferation with bromodeoxyridine. The liver itself, by the way, stains. That's, that's an artifact. Don't worry about that. But there's there's in the deep in the core of the metastasis, there's viable uh, non-proliferating hypoxic cells. So all of our adjuvant chemotherapy drugs are proliferation dependent drugs: fluorouracil, gemcitabine. So if bromodeoxyridine isn't going in them, gemcitabine isn't going to go there either. But we do have drugs. This is one TH302. They're actually metabolically activated under hypoxic conditions. And we can actually give these in combination with gemcitabine. It actually breaks down. This is actually another 2-nitromidazole that undergoes reductive metabolism, destabilizes and releases this alkylating. This is actually a nitrogen mustard. Is this warhead. So we could combine this with gemcitabine in a neoadjuvant setting. So the patient's got metastases, but they're small metastases. These micrometastases are the basis for recurrence in patients who've had pancreatectomy. We actually see patients coming to our clinic in medical oncology two months after they've had a Whipple and they've already got liver metastases. So it's a disaster. We can actually measure non-invasively hypoxia. This is a paper that just came out in Journal of Nuclear Medicine, which I think is the first study to actually show you can do this using uh, nitromidazole traces by PET PET emitters. And this is the cancer here. So we actually measure hypoxia. So we could we could actually stratify patients preoperatively if they're hypoxic, instead of going straight to surgery, move them into a neoadjuvant study that would combine an agent like this with gemcitabine. So that would be something we could do that may impact on patient outcome in the <coughs> short term. I'm going to move on now to local disease control, which is an under underappreciated problem with pancreatic cancer. It's, most people think that pancreatic cancer just metastasizes in the dead, sort of things like that. But in fact, it's a major clinical problem. The majority are unresectable. It's only 20% max are resectable. So most patients with pancreatic cancer actually die with a primary tumor intact. It's one of the relatively small number of common solid tumors now where we actually fail to control the primary tumor. And it's a problem. It's been estimated from autopsy studies that about 30 to 40 percent actually die primarily from local disease, not from metastases. We have two projects going on that I'm going to talk about fairly briefly to try to address local disease control in pancreatic cancer. One is somewhat exotic. <laughs> it's a photothermal ablation, which is something I'm doing with Gang Zhang, who's here and Brian Wilson, and also Christian McLaughlin, who is a postdoc with us there. This is using nanotechnology to uh, try to heat the tumor um, without destroying surrounding tissues. And then the other project I'm doing, which I'm going to talk very briefly, because this is really John Kim's project, is the stereotactic radiotherapy in the mouse model to simulate what we will do in the patients. So let's start with the photothermal ablation. It's based around these structures, which... Um, developed by gangs, and these are nano. This is, this is nanotechnology. I could talk for a long time. I probably couldn't because I don't know enough about it. But there's a lot to be said about nanotechnology. <laughs> these are engineered structures that have some very interesting uh, physical um, and chemical <clears throat> properties. Uh, these particles are actually based around a porphyrin. This uh, this is novel. Porphyrins do all kinds of interesting things, uh, but they uh, the purpose of this. Uh, particular application there, they, they, they strongly absorb light and they get hot. These particles heat up when you put light into them. They heat up very rapidly. So the question is, they, they localize in the tumor. This is uh, one of our xenografts with the porphyrosome given to the mouse. And the red is the porphyrosome. And it's pretty uniformly distributed in the tumor. And actually, Christine has got some pictures of pretty yucky. You actually open up the mouse's belly and look with uh, light at that and then pick, take a picture and you can see so the cancer glows in the middle. It's pretty, it's pretty coolly selective for the cancer. Um, 
So this is her rig. You're basically trying to introduce laser light into the tumor after the mouse has been given the porphyrosome, and then just measure the temperature. Do you really heat the tumor up? And it's pretty promising. So these are her data. This is using infrared imaging to measure the temperature of the tumor. And it gets pretty hot. This is, this is with the, uh, um, with the porphyrosome. And 70 degrees is pretty hot. That's going to kill, that's going to kill the thing pretty, pretty stone dead. Without the uh, sensitizer, you still get some, you still get some heating with the laser light, but it's not nearly as much. So it's pretty, and it's pretty fast going. This is time in seconds to heat it up. So the idea is you'd give the patient the porphyrosome. Incidentally, you can track where they're going with MRI because it's para, you can make them paramagnetic. So it's moving into the tumor. If it doesn't get there well enough, you can put an antibody on the outside to make it localize more carefully. So it loads into the tumor. You then introduce the laser through an endoscope. You may want to cool the duodenum, which you can readily, readily do, at the, do at the same time, and then put the light in. Would you then ablate the tumor? It's very exciting. It's based, again, some, on some of our, our, our technical strengths, GANG's lab, the Guided Therapeutics Laboratory, uh, the surgical program. There's a lot we could do here. It's still in its infancy, but we're, we're ongoing with that, and it's quite encouraging. The radiotherapy is obviously much more understandable to most of the people in this room. Um, this is really a collaboration with John Kim, although Dick Hill refuses to go into retirement, and Dick is actually our wise father. He's mentored probably half the people in this room, myself included. <coughs> And the intent is to simulate stereotactic radiotherapy closely to what we would be doing in the patient. But the cool thing about doing this in the mouse is that we can then manipulate with targeted agents to enhance the radiation effect. And we're particularly interested in hypoxia targeting. Hypoxia may well become more relevant to stereotactic radiotherapy. We're giving a limited number of high dose fractions you may not get the reoxygenation effect that occurs with long um, conventional fraction H in there. So hypoxia is probably going to be important. Some of you, some of you may have heard uh, Catherine O'Brien's work recently on this in the, in the rectal cancer models. And the other area that I'm interested in is the G2 checkpoint inhibitors. And I'll say a little bit about that momentarily. So it, it allows us to study the <coughs> action of drugs. And importantly for this <coughs> disease site, to study the effects on adjacent normal tissues, especially bowel. So this is now some of the work going on in this STAR program. It uses the microirradiator in STAR, which has cone beam CT on it. Um, we'd hope that the cone beam CT would actually allow us to see the tumor as it would be done with a patient, but the resolution really isn't good enough. So we have to merge with the, an MRI, which we do with the seven Tesla system. It's much crisper now, by the way, than that slide I showed right at the very beginning of Nisha's first attempt at MRI in a mouse model as a tumor. And then we just fuse them together and we can then target. I totally fail to understand this. This is done by one of the planning people. This is using something called Smart Plan 180. Oh, John can explain all of this to you later on there. But basically, we're trying to get as close to how we would do this in a human population. And it's, it's, it's cool because you can perceive excitement amongst the people involved in physics and planning in radiation medicine. This is cool because we can actually start doing things in a mouse model that we would, it's sort of what we would do in the patients, but it's, um, it's difficult to do in the patients. So we're actually showing that, I think that basically you're zapping the tumor without doing a lot of damage to adjacent tissues. And it looks like it might work. So this is now, Control. This is either five by seven gray or five by nine grays. This is the growth of the tumor without radiation. These, are, these data are still ongoing. We're still monitoring. These mice are still only out a short distance. Uh, and these measurements are pretty crude. We're actually would do the volume measurements of the MRI eventually. So I may be sort of stealing John's thunder on this. But it's quite nice. We can actually see an effect now. The mice are surviving. I don't show the weight, but they don't actually lose significant amounts of weight. So we can now start to do experiments. And that's really where I came into this. So I've been interested in targeting cell cycle checkpoints. It gives me an excuse to do flow cytometry. And one of the uh, 
uh, interesting questions is that, and it's been around for a long time, is if, if we give radiation, we cause a lot of breaks and damage into DNA, and that the cells normally then arrest during G2 to allow those breaks to be repaired before entering mitosis. And if they enter mitosis before they're repaired, the cells can die or they, they become arrested in mitosis. The guardian of the G2 checkpoint is V1, and we can now target that with drugs. This is MK1775, which is in clinical trial at PMH. Uh, normal tissues like the gut mucosa, on the other hand, are P53 proficient, and we will be expected to arrest in G1, so that G2 targeting G, G2 is irrelevant to. So you'd expect you'd, you'd enhance effects on the cancer, but not on the adjacent small bowel, which is what we're trying to achieve. <coughs> So these are some, I have to say, these are pretty good flow cytometry data. I review papers. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty decent stuff. This is one of our xenographs. Now, this is a DNA histogram. G, this, first week, G, this is DNA content. Deployed mouse, deployed cancer. It's aneuploid, S phase, and G2. So that's a classic DNA histogram. If we now look at cycl cyclin A2 increases during S phase, and then it degrades the cells move through prophase towards metaphase. So this is the degradation of cyclin. If we combine that with uh, a second antibody measuring serine 10-phosphorylation on histone H3, that is phosphorylated by Aurora B as cells are entered into mitosis, you can kind of pause uh, the late cell cycle combining those antibodies with DNA content. Oh, I haven't lost you too much there. But the important point is that if you give... Uh, eight grays radiation, you see this increase in the G2 population, which is the G2 checkpoint activating. But then if four hours later you give the Wee one inhibitor, you have this huge increase in the peak. But these, this increase is caused by cells now appearing in metaphase. So this is abrogation of the G2 checkpoint uh, induced by radiation in a clinically relevant model. So the question is, do we then sensitize to radiation by giving a we one inhibitor. And that's what we'll do once we get the, we, the SBRT model standardized. I want to get off and work on that. So John can have hypoxia, and I can have the we one inhibitor because it's drugs. Um, but one of the curious things that we found with this experiment is if we just give the we one inhibitor by itself without radiation, we also have this huge surge of cells going into mitosis. This is histone H3 phosphorus. Remember, I said this is marking cells in mitosis. This is DNA content. So this is G1, S phase, G2. These are mitotic cells. So there's a huge increase in mitosis just by giving a we one inhibitor without exogenous DNA damage, which is not what we're supposed to see. It's pretty striking. This is a time course for cells appearing in metaphase up around two to four hours. So this is basically... This, this can only be explained by G2 is being prolonged in these cells in a wee one dependent manner, even though you don't put external damage into the cells. So they're just needing a longer in G2. This is the carrier type. Actually, if you're astute, you can see this is a, has a roughly triploid DNA content by flow cytometry. And if you look at the chromosomes, there's a roughly 1.5 times the number of chromosomes you should have. But it's... It's, it's complete crap. I mean, there's not a single normal, normal chromosome in this tumor. So if the chromosomes are really screwed up. So the question is, is this genomic damage by itself causing dependence on the G2 checkpoint? So I can put this another way around and say, is chromosomal instability an Achilles heel of pancreatic cancer? What I haven't uh, told you or shown is some recent sequencing data coming from our program here, which indicates that one of the striking things in pancreatic cancer is that the chromosomes really are very, very unstable. So there are much more chromosomal derangements going on in pancreas, say, in other common cancers. So do they become dependent on post-replication checkpoints? So is this a valid way of treating these cancers? Because chromosome instability is probably one reason why they do so badly in the clinic. They're continually shuffling the genes around. You're selecting for metastatic drug resistance. So this probably explains in large measure why pancreatic cancer is such a brute to treat. So is this Achilles heel? So I've redrawn this diagram, my cell cycle diagram now, 
And I put errors in breaks occur during DNA replication, predictably more frequent in pancreatic cancers. This is the G2 checkpoint I was talking about, but there's a second checkpoint which may be more relevant here, and that's uh, the mitotic spindle, the spindle assembly checkpoint. This is the one that holds the chromosomes on the metaphase plate until they attach to the uh, spindle poles so that when the cells actually go into <coughs> F anaphase, the chromosomes faithfully separate. And if you prevent them from doing that, and they go into mitosis without allowing the chromosomes to align and attach, you'll get, you'll get gross chromosomal breaks. <coughs> and is that fatal to the cells? And we actually have a pretty decent TTK inhibitor that was actually developed in-house by a group headed up by TACMAC. It's actually one of the first TTK inhibitors to be developed. So let's test this drug. So it's CFI Campbell Family Institute. Well, it's in the house. Let's just test this. Uh, and we've done this using some cell lines that we actually established from our patients. So most all the work I've been showing so far is using xenografts. We can actually, from those xenografts, grow, uh, grow cell lines. They're getting further away from the patient, but they're much easier to manipulate than uh, the xenograft. So if this is just a screen on nine different cell lines. This is now looking at the TTK inhibitor. And this is now measuring clonogenic survival. So if you're giving a treatment that you think is going to cause chromosomal derangements that are going to stop the cell from proliferating any further, but may not necessarily kill the cell, clonogenic survival is a good way to go. So uh, this, is the, this is the control value, normal clonogenic survival. And it's interesting that six out of the nine are getting quite large loss of clonogenic survival. And curiously, the other three, there's no effect at all. So what's going on there? I, these are very new data. So we're still trying to figure it out. But it's interesting, if you take the ones, two of the ones that are sensitive, this one here and this one here, and look at the DNA content after 24 hours, the great thing, these are really screwed up, DNA histogram. That's the control, G1, S phase G2. You've got these cells with hugely amyloid DNA content, whereas the one that's coming, this is GP3A, which is where I've lost my pointer. This, one, this is the one that's resistant. There's no effect on DNA content. So at least we can link the toxicity of the TTK inhibitor by clonogenic survival to some measurement that tells us about the chromosome content there. So this is very much ongoing. Uh, we're re-establishing the tumors back into the primer xenograft to test the TTK inhibitor in the xenografts. We'll ask, we're asking with the group at OICR, can we detect a genomic sign signature that predicts response to TTK inhibitor? If the, if the answer is yes to both of these, the xenografts recapitulate. I mean, yes, we can find a signature. Then we can put the signature into the COMPASS trial and then start thinking about stratifying patients towards TTK inhibitor down the line. So that would be, that would be good. In terms of genomics-based personalized medicine for pancreatic cancer, we're furthest along with um, the BRCA homologous repair deficiencies. So we were actually, with patients with high likelihood of having a germline BRCA mutation, we actually screen for them and we direct treatment towards platinum-based chemotherapy because empirically uh, this mutation seems to carry with it exquisite platinum sensitivity. These are a bunch of uh, xenografts again uh, these are wild-type donors. These are mutant donors looking at the relative effects of gemcitabine. This is a wild-type, incidentally, response to gemcitabine, but does not respond to this platinum, which is a clinical experience, whereas all of the mutants, all four of the mutants, uh, xenografts, respond well to cisplatin, which is good. I mean, the problem is that there's only, well, you can say the problem, there's only about 5% of our patient populations can benefit from this because they carry the mutation. But what's coming out of the ongoing sequencing work is about a further 5% have a somatic, I call it brackenness, I'm probably not the right word to, term to use for it there, but they have a signature that suggests they, even though they don't have a germline, they may, they may nevertheless respond well to cisplatin. So this would be useful information to have in the clinic. So fortuitously, we have four or five primary xenografts that we've grown from patients who are subsequently found to have this signature. And we're currently testing their sensitivity uh, to cisplatin 
in the lab. Again, I'm not going to give enough time to give it due attention is a project that's headed by Ray Riley over in pharmaceutical sciences called Pet Theranostics. So this is now using local expertise in antibody engineering. And this is headed by Sackler Devu in the Toronto Recombinant Antibody Center. Ray Riley, who's one of the top experts in radio pharmacology uh, at, across at the ph pharmacy, Mitch Winnick in chemistry, and then my group are involved in the translation into, into pancreatic cancer. And it's, the idea is to make uh, individualized treatment using synthetic antibody fragments to surface antigens expressed on the cancer, eventually at the individual patient level, armed with dual positron emitters so we can detect by PET imaging, beta emitters for therapy. Oh, yeah, so this is TRAC. This is one of the jewels in, it's across at the Donnelly Center, incidentally. This is one of the jewels in Toronto that we don't, we don't go across College Street enough. So uh, Dev Sidhu is one of the top guns in antibody engineering in North America. He was at Genentech, he was recruited here. And they do things with antibodies. These, these antibodies, they've never seen a rabbit or anything like that. It's all E. coli and you get the series, well, you don't want this amino acid. I'll take it out and put another amino acid in there. So uh, he has the ability using phage display techniques to make you know, thousands or tens of thousands of synthetic antibodies, more or less on demand if you want something made. Dev is your person. Um, the conjugation technique, though, is quite cool. So what we're trying to do is to put a radionuclide, it's rather like the, the site, we're trying to put radionuclides on the antibody away from the antigen binding site, which is here. And what this is done, this is done by a grad student in the chemistry department, is that they actually manipulate the, the gene sequence so that on the heavy chain, you put a short peptide growing off the end where the FC receptor would, the FC component would normally be. And then you can use this peptide to enzymatically link, link the polymer this onto the end of the antibody. So you get these bizarre structures. And this is her rending of how it would go. So patient one, patient two, you actually dial up the antibody fragment to the patient's individual surface immunophenotype. You can then use a PET do a, a light dusting with isotope, do a PET emission to make sure it's going to the right place, and then bring the patient onto the 17th floor to one of those rooms that radiation oncology uses, get them really hot, bang the stuff into the patient, and can you cook the tumor? And this might be particularly efficacious, I think, for treating uh, micrometastases in high-risk patients where you take, do a Whipple, find its bad risk features, likely to have micrometastases, you've got the surface immunophenotype based on the pathological sample, dial up the appropriate antibody combinations and treat. This is, it's like the photothermal ablation. It's, it's a little forward looking, but I think we should, we, we should be thinking forward and we should be supporting these uh, local efforts. This is just some early data showing we can actually use this approach to image one of our xenografts using PET imaging there. So that's kind of quite promising. So conclusions then, pancreatic cancer remains a tough challenge. I don't, I don't make light of that. Um, there's no low-hanging fruit left, <coughs> but I think this middle-hanging fruit is actually quite exciting. And there's lots of good stuff going on in Toronto right now, which I wanted to bring out in this talk. So these are my acknowledgements. So, but basically I dedicate it to, the, this, is a, this is a celebration of Toronto, this talk. I'm just saying that, look, we're not that bad here. We actually are a top, internationally top un research university. We're better probably at communicating than some of the competitors south of the border because you don't have these islands of Nobel laureates trying to control everything. Everybody sort of works happy together. All the grad students across the university I've met. I'm just totally happy to get engaged here. Fluidime are just wonderful. It's, they're more like a, a, a university department than a business. Um, and so these are all the wonderful. I won't, I won't read all the names up. These are just all the great people around there. So I said right at the beginning, pancreas ought to be the pits. You know, we're in clinical outlook there. But it's actually a surprisingly upbeat program right now. So we're, and it's always on the lookout for recruits. So thank you very much.